This podcast is proud to be part of the Talk Sport Fan Network. Talk Sport. Powered by fans. Hello and welcome to Red Side of the Trent as Forrest returned from the international break and to the city ground in what could be deemed a pivotal moment in the season as they prepare to find out where their destination may lie as they prepare to face winless Crystal Palace. Joining me to discuss the game are Lee Clark and Sky Sports commentator Seb Hutchinson of all people. Um, Lee, first of all, how are you? Yeah, very good. Looking forward to getting stuck in as ever. Great. Um, Seb, thank you very much for joining us. Obviously, I slid into the DMs when you saw um, our intro where you hever, you heavily feature. Um, how are you, first of all? Oh, well, I want to say thank you for putting me in the intro. I think the, that's that's an honour, I have to say. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on the likeness of the cartoon, but <laughs> you can't complain about these things, can you? Absolutely. No, it, was mean, a great, I mean, it was a great moment as well. Did anyone that appeared in your Twitter feed, did you think, what the hell is going on? No, not at all, because I, I always say this to people. It doesn't matter what game you're doing. It's important to the supporters of that game, you know, the supporters who are watching that game. And you always get this thing thrown at you. Why are you going so crazy over, you know, Forest v Southampton at the back of the season? <laughs> that's, because, that's because those moments matter to every supporter and you just don't know what that means in the great grand scheme of things. And I felt at that moment that Danilo goal was very, very important um, at that point in the season. Uh more because of the buffer it gave Forrest in that particular game. And you always feel in games when you're playing against sides near the bottom end of the league, every goal is huge because the fact you're at the bottom of the league, towards the bottom of the league, means you've struggled to score goals or keep them out in the season. So that moment as well and the Gibbs-White touch and Danilo's name, it just all fitted very well. That's all I can say. Do, do you think it had been... Um, it was quite fitting, I thought, that it was Danilo who scored. Uh, do you think it would have been quite as, um, what's the word, quite as memorable, I guess, if it was Danilo with the little flick for Gibbs-White instead? That's a good question. Uh, that's a good question. It felt right that Gibbs-White was the man to flick it to Danilo because he's such he's a figure almost whereby I think he's underappreciated by clubs, fans of other clubs in his role in Forest's situation that they're in now. I mean, I've always thought he was a player with huge potential and I always think back to the under 17 side that won the World Cup because I was heavily across that particular year in general at England youth level and he was fortunate to be starting in that team as the tournament progressed mainly because Jaden Sancho had gone to Dortmund had gone to Borussia Dortmund and they wanted him back in their side even though he was 17 so that meant he he played in the group stage Sancho and then Gibbs White came into the team when Sancho went home and there's a bit of a reshuffle and and I don't know if you call it irony but Callum Hudson Odoi was was in the team he moved out to the left where Sancho was playing and the rest is history for that team and obviously we have to thank Steve Cooper to, to, for bringing those two together you have to say because that was always Cooper's goal when he managed sides to get those players into his team because he knew them from youth level and I know it's been a story told many a time, but you, you're keeping across the development of those players. And I thought he would eventually break into the Wolves side. When he made that big move to Forest. I thought that's a great move for him because they valued him to bring him into the club. And for him to play a part in that particular goal, but for Danilo to be a player who was actually touted by other clubs in the league at the time, and when Forrest got him, it felt a bit of a coup, actually. Unfortunately, injuries haven't played their part, but that combination of them of Forrest having that criticism from signing so many players, but two signings who have worked out pretty well, I have to say, unfortunately with the injuries with Danilo, but two very good signings overall. So it felt right. Whichever way round you put it, it would have worked. 
Yeah, it was what it's one of my favorite pieces of commentary, Seb. I have to say because it's like because of the whole because of Danilo's name as well. It just makes yeah, it. That's... It just it just it just sends it off so well. And obviously, like you say, massive massive game. But um, it people might be wondering why you're here. But basically, when I spoke to you um, in, in, in privately on Twitter and that, you basically said I'll, I'm gonna I'll come on on the pod when I'm doing a Forest game, and you happen to be commentating Forest Crystal Palace, where we've actually jokingly just said on our last pod. Like, how have Sky messed this up? Forest haven't won at home. Palace haven't won a game all season. You've drawn the short straw, obviously. I did want to know, um, because I used to think this was as a kid, and it's probably similar to what a lot of people think about teachers, where they don't go home, they just live at the school. And I just kind of think that about commentators that live in gantry boxes. Um, so how do, how, does, how do Sky make the process of choosing said commentator for what game and, and kind of what, what prep goes into that? job role i say as far as choosing the commentator it depends because a big part of it can be where you live but actually sometimes it's just a case of looking at the fixture so we're looking at forest and uh palace this monday i mean i live in the east midlands anyway so it sort of helps and that's probably why i ended up with a lot of forest games last season i have to say but <laughs> i also think it it would it, it, it come on a roll so you sometimes are grouped together with teams and you do a lot of their games so of the past couple of seasons i ended up on a roll with everton games forest games and arsenal games and they it works because then you're familiar with those teams on that role and you get into the rhythm of this is what they're fighting for this is what they're looking to achieve and I think that sort of worked with Forrest last season. There was that awkward period where it was whether was Cooper going to keep his job? Uh, how behind Cooper were the Forrest supporters at that point in time? Because there was a, sort of a disconnect, I think, from the general media and how Forrest fans felt about Cooper. Because ultimately, when you have a manager, and it's quite topical with what we've seen with Tuchel taking over the England job, is at what point do you recognise coaches and their work and what they're up against. He took Forrest up to the Premier League, up having been away for so long. Then you come into the Premier League and look at Russell Martin now and the level steps up. And I think Maranakis recognised that, to be fair to him, and he knew that you have to bring quality into the team. So you have players in the squad that you have connections to, but you need to improve the quality. And you could say it's a risk bringing in so many players, but he recognised that that was important. We have to bring quality into the club. I'm saying all of this as a long-winded way of answering your question because I think you get under the skin of clubs when you're given a run with them. Um, this is my first Forest game of the season, but because I've had that run with them in the past, I find it so much easier to slip back in because you keep across the games, you're still across these sides. And, I, I, and people ask about my prep and everything else, but I always think once I've done a side for the first time, Within a window, let's not be frank. You know, if it's four years ago, that's something completely different. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm into them. I got into a role. For example, I've done a Wrexham game this season, and I have another one of theirs coming up in the FA Cup. So then I know, bang, that's not a problem for me. I could slip back in, and I don't have an issue because my number one thing when I'm commentating is who are the players, what type of players are they, and how do they work in this team framework, and what does that make the team look like. And I feel with Forest right now, they've they've had this change under Nuno. But ultimately, I still look at them as a side who are defensively, and I'm sure, I'm sure you're going to get into this anyway, but I think they're defensively quite strong this season. Defensively quite solid. Now, you can make of this what you will. There's a lot of similarities in the data between Forest and Everton from a defensive point of view. Um, if you're going to stay up in the league, in fact, any position in the league, the defence is the number one thing to start with. Because that means it's so easy to say, but you don't concede any goals. You only need one. If you're conceding three or four every week, you're in, you're bang in trouble, and you can't beat teams four three every week like you did to Southampton in that in that match. I think one of the things I've always wanted to ask an actual commentator is the relationship between yourself and a co-commentator. <laughs> so, like, you 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 watch a game and you're, you're flicking through social media, and. It, it it seems to me. To Why are you doing that? that Why, what? Gets, I know. Yeah, it's ridiculous. You shouldn't do it. Like Reese always says, he was on the pod. He says it's toxic. You shouldn't be bothering with it. But it tends to be the co-commentator that does get the lion's share of the critique. Um, so I just wondered, from your point of view, what kind of 
what makes a good co-commentator and what's the like the relationship with on a match day when you when you link up with with whoever it is i i was thinking the with a co-com a co-commentator is 99 times out of 100 so certainly in this con- country 100 times 100 percent of the time an ex-professional footballer and with that carries a certain amount of gravitas but it also is going to bring them into the realm of criticism because of the nature of football the biases involved the way fans will feel about their club and that particular individual and their relationship with their club so if they play for a great rival of theirs even if that player that cocon played for their club that can bring criticism from them because yeah, you're not sticking up for us why aren't you supporting us or if they were a rival why did why are you saying this about our club You've got something against our club, blah, blah, blah. So that carries a strong part of things. Um, and people are sensitive about their club. So therefore, whatever a COCOM says is going to annoy somebody. But they, you have to look under the surface of it and think to yourself, this is an individual who has played at a certain level. And let's be frank, even if that level was League Two or the National League, it's far above the level that most supporters have played at. And we don't realise that a lot of the time. Um, I remember doing a game last season where it was in the FA Cup and Coventry were playing Maidstone. And you, Coventry, are in the Championship and Maidstone National League. And you're watching this game and you realise, goodness me, even between those levels, the gap is huge. And we are critical of the players in the Premier League and we don't realise their level a lot of the time. Um, And what they have to go through so we might simplify it so we might look at a game and we'll say uh why why are they saying that about this player what are they seeing i'm not seeing i don't see that i don't think of it that way they don't understand i watch my team every week they don't understand but they've been in the thick of the action and how you i can't remember who it was i was listening to the other day but they were talking about how somebody would be described uh players action would be described as a schoolboy error but Yes, they've made an error, but there's a reason why they made the error because of who they're up against, the pressure, the time to think. And I think to my house, uh, someone will ask me, what do you think separates the top players from your average player? And it's speed of thought. It's the decisions they make, the speed in which they make those decisions. So most professionals can say trap a ball that's fired at them from a certain you know, distance. But how quickly can they trap that ball and then make the right decision under huge pressure? Or under and pressure is not just somebody closing you down. Pressure is your teammates making runs. Pressure is the expectation put on you by the manager. So this, I suppose this is a defense of co-commentators. I've not played at that level. So I might say from my point of view, from the broadcasting angle, I may be better with words. I may be better at picking the right word at the right time and maybe better tapping into what the fan sees but I can never criticize how they go about it I can only say from a cocon what do I want from a cocon from my point of view I just want them to tell me something that I don't know and I think a lot of fans think I want them to tell me something that I do know I want them to fit into my narrative I want them to align with what I've seen so I can sit there at home and I can say yeah that's what I was thinking Dave, that's why I was. Didn't I say that two minutes ago, Dave? And that's what that's what it's about. So they can't really win from that point of view. Um, uh, that's that's all I can say. If that helps, are you, answer are, it, are you able to say I was with you on uh, Monday? Yes, Alan Smith, Alan oh, Smith, yeah. who who is up there with one of the nicest men I've ever met in football, and also somebody who I think has done a good job of. He is from an era that transcends from pre-Premier League and into the Premier League, the start of the Premier League, and has also gone on this journey, this broadcasting journey of what it's become today, which is absolute chalk and cheese from a broadcasting point of view to when the Premier League started. It's just incredible. And obviously there's going to be a lot of supporters now who weren't even born when the Premier League started to understand how much football has changed. It's, It's absolutely incredible. But the heart of it, the actual heart of it, playing the game on the pitch there's not a lot of difference for the footballer's life, if that makes sense, in terms of on the pitch. Off the pitch, completely different. But on well, the pitch, not too much. 
Also, Alan Smith might be one of the few people that's allowed in the city ground in the gantry box, seeming Gary Neville called as mafia and Jamie Carragher as an arse, basically, to us most of the time. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll digress. Do you take that as a compliment, though? I think oh, that's yeah, a compliment massively. to what, what Forest supporters are able to produce at the city ground. You've made it somewhere that's, if you know what I mean, interesting. I say interesting <laughs> for people to come to. Place. Yeah. Definitely yeah, I love it. So I, I, that's probably the right word to use. But I think with with Gary Neville, I mean, and and Carragher, both they like completely dim- dismissed everything that we've done this season. They've completely contradicted a lot of things they've personally said, especially with the the whole refereeing thing. And we'll we'll get your reaction and, and Lee's reaction because we didn't hear from him uh, the other day about it with the the fine. So that will be mm. at some point uh, a topic. Um, I just I did want to ask you actually. Um, uh, Seb, that I don't know how much of Palace you've managed to watch this season, but I just wanted a, a neutral's kind of point of view whether you think their winless start to the season kind of represents how they've actually played. Because when I've looked at results and stuff, they're, they're still pretty much in games, only losing maybe by the odd goal or or two to the better sides. But they're not like it's not as if they're getting thrashed or anything, and they're still creating quite a fair few chances. They're just obviously not doing enough to win football matches at the moment. And obviously Oliver Glass has been reported um, under pressure now and looks like David Moyes could be in line to take over if they don't start getting their act together. So is is Monday night just as a big game for Forrest being at home to get that that uh, that win there as it is for Palace to get off the mark, essentially? Exactly. When you said, why did Sky pick this game? And they must be thinking, oh no, because we're not going to get many goals. I think it's a completely different scenario. Crystal Palace right now, they just want to get that win under their belts. It's, it's quite alarming when you look at it from a results point of view because they ended the season, when you think April onwards, I think only Manchester City had a be- better record than Palace from April onwards. And we looked at Glasner and we thought, oh my God, he's completely changed this side. He's letting that front line express themselves and they look dangerous. Well, a big part of that front line was Michael Elise and they've lost him. And every club goes through this process whereby they have to lose a key player every season. Certainly the clubs, I was, actually every club can go through this, even the club sides at the top of the table because contracts run out. Players are looking elsewhere. The player's being coveted. And obviously we're in this new era where clubs are working through this financial regulation system and Forrest being one of those, as we know. So Palace have gone through that. They've brought players now, I think off the top of my head, where they brought in about a revenue just under £100 million and they spent about £76 million of that. So when you're looking at that from a deficit point of view, they're still a player short and that's not taking into account that Mark Gahey was very strongly linked to a move to Newcastle and in most circumstances, he probably would have gone. But I think Anderson going meant they couldn't really lose him as well. And then the player they brought in, they've is, has picked up a bad injury. So that's where I think they've struggled this season. Disruption to their back line, even though their defence is still strong, and disruption to their forward line. Um, they brought in Nketiah, but still Elise is a big old loss because Palace, I always felt last season, they were relatively strong at the back. But what made them look quite special was They'd have Eze on one side and they'd have Elise on the other. And Mateta was almost that battering ram through the middle. And you know, as Forest supporters, that when your team's really clicking, you've got wide men who are causing damage and you've got a target man who's knocking defenders this way and that. Now, Forest have the big target men. They've got two of them, really. But at least right now, in the situation where Edouard, they've let go on loan. And Ayu also they've lost in that front line. So when you've got disruption in the front line, it doesn't matter what side you are, any disruption to your team can take you time to sort out. And you have to be quite fortunate that you bring in players that slot straight in and make you go bang. Now, Palace have managed to do that in their central defence. They brought in an absolute titan in their back line. But Palace haven't, uh, for, Palace haven't been able to do that. So they're in a situation where... They just, I think they just need to see that forward line click. And Eze has been very unfortunate. I think there's only two players in the Premier League who've had more shots than him this season. And yeah, he's got one goal for that return. Now, you might say he's having too many of those shots from outside the box, which is true. Um, But also, he's just waiting for it to click. He's a player who's in that Euro squad. Everybody who's involved in that England Euro squad has taken time to get their act together this season. Um, And we have to cut that slack as well. 
So look at Adam Wharton, he's been carrying a knock as well, and it's not quite worked out for him. Even if you weren't playing many minutes, it's just that emotional exhaustion of going through that process this season. We've just seen Lamina Miles picked up a injury as well. So it's not just England focused. You get to the back end of that tournament, you've got problems. Look, Rodri's out for a period of time now. So that can't be discounted in Forrest's situation there. There's there, there, there's Wharton there. And I think that plays a big part of it. I really rate Glasner as a manager. And I really rate managers who think about this sort of thing. Um, I just think you have to give him more time. I think the Palace fans will because of how the back of the season ended. And I think the ownership will. It's expensive to get rid of a manager as well. <laughs> We've got to play that into account. And whatever the links are, Forrest have got some fixtures now where you think they'll be eyeing them up. But so will Forrest. That's what I love. That's what I love about these sort of these games is both sets of supporters will look at this fixture and go, we should win that or we can win that. And that's what makes the this these games so great. I looked at it last week, Wolves, when they played Brentford and I was doing a Wolves game a couple of weeks ago and their supporters were looking at the idea of, well, we can win at Brentford. And I was thinking, mm. when you when you think that way, the moment you lose those games, that's where the supporters' feelings change. So if Forrest lose on Monday to Palace, I can guarantee all that good feeling about the start of the season will evaporate and everyone will be looking and going, oh, hold on a minute. We lost at home to Fulham and we've lost at home to Palace. We've got a problem. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. I mean, you I'll lost be to honest, Palace that... on Monday. You're dead right, but I actually think a lot of our fans already think there's a serious problem at home. We've played Wolves, Bournemouth and Palace. Uh, sorry, Wolves, Bournemouth and Fulham, and we've got two points at home. So as good as we have been away, I think there's already... I mean, Adam will back me up that uh, we do have a section of supporters that will... We we could win 3-0 in a Champions League final, and it should have been four, um, with some section of our supporters. But to be fair, there is a bit of a, con a perception at the minute that home form has been a real struggle. Um, since Nuno came in, um, which ties me on quite nicely to my next question, to be fair. Um, obviously, when Nuno replaced Cooper, you've kind of got two contrasting styles in terms of the head coaches and, and kind of how they perceived in the media a little bit. I just wonder if you kind of, did you share that kind of scepticism when he was appointed? And has he surprised you a little bit at how one full pre-season seems to have really you know, improved us? Uh, defensively, you mean, or just mean overall? Do you, just do you across see the board, overall? I think there was there was lots of suggestions that when he came in, he was a negative manager going forward. Um, obviously, last season we had a go in most games, but again, we couldn't quite get that cohesion at home. Um, now, obviously, with a full pre-season, so I think there was some reports during the rounds in the summer that Marinakis actually considered sacking him twice last season, um, but he, he stuck with him, gave him a full. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that I know, mean? yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's ridiculous. That that notion is ridiculous. But yeah. thankfully, he has given him full pre-season, um, and certainly away from home, to have ten points from seven games, I think, is probably ahead of the, you know par for the course. So. I just wondered if that had, had surprised you a little bit based on what Nuno kind of... He had a reputation to rediscover a bit from his Tottenham uh, day, didn't he? So mm -hmm. I just wonder if he had surprised you and if, if Forrest have surprised you in general this season, to be honest. I think there was no surprise from Nuno at all. I saw him at Wolves. I made them a side difficult to beat. And if you make your side difficult to beat, then what you really need is just some flair in the team to make the difference in some of these games, especially against as you say, sides where you're at home and you're thinking we should win these games. It's the flair that makes the difference. That's what helped Palace last season. Um, and that's probably where Forrest are coming up short. And the big example was the moment Gibbs White was out at home to Fulham, the side he put out there, I, I imagine, and, and I can guess that a lot of Forrest supporters were thinking, oh, come on, come on. We've got an opportunity with Gibbs White out. Why are we not paying two wingers at home to Fulham? So, and the way the game transpired, you lose a game narrowly. That plays out that way because you've not, Fulham haven't come and turned you over. Fulham are a good side, by the way. They haven't come, not come and turned you over. You've lost at home narrowly and you're looking there with regret and thinking, oh, come on, you know, why didn't we give this game a go? Which is where we are with Palace on Monday with Nuno now. So what is he going to do with Gibbs White 50-50? If Gibbs White can't play, How's he gonna? How's he gonna put this team out? 
if you were if he puts the team out on Monday with Anderson say in the ten, and he's got the two wingers out wide, Hudson Adoy and Alanga, and he goes with a team like that, the Forest fans I think will be pleased that he's gone right. This is how we're going to approach it, especially with the form that Anderson's in, and. But if he doesn't do that and he says maybe shunts Anderson out to the wide area, brings another central midfielder in, people will think, oh, OK, he's, he's gone negative again. But I think Nuno's first thought is this idea of we have to be secure. We have to be secure. Look at Tottenham at the moment. They were upset about the way that Nuno played and to an extent Conte played. Now, Postacoglu comes in and plays a style of football which is far more attractive to watch. Any neutral will say if they watch Spurs play, they enjoy those games. But how much are Tottenham enjoying the games when they don't really know what's going to happen? You've got no <laughs> idea. It's so it's an insecure feeling for anybody watching that team. So do you want Forrest to be like that? Or do you get that sense of, we want the best of both, both worlds, don't we, really? Um, I'm not surprised with the way Nuno's done it. And I think he's... He's a, he's a manager more experienced than Cooper managing senior pros. We have to say that. Um, and he's also, and this is again difficult for British managers, is that we have this tendency in the Premier League, of course. He had a chance, Nuno, to prove himself in abroad. And he did it with Valencia. And that's what brought him to the Premier League. And then from there, he's trusted. He's had senior players at a top league in Europe. He's come to the Premier League. With Wolves, it worked with a lot of his fellow countrymen in the team. And now he's come to from Spurs now onto Forest, where he's got a little bit more credit in the bank. But I think that Tottenham spell really harmed the way people feel about him. And that's probably where your doubt is coming from with him, perhaps. If he'd come straight from Wolves to Forest, they might be feeling, of, well, we'll give him a bit more time. Look what he did with Wolves. But I think that Spurs period is maybe giving you some doubts about it. I don't think I've, I've said it at the start of this answer. I know it's a long answer, like all my answers have been. That's the nature of a commentator. <laughs> at the start, <laughs> but at the start of it, it was that feeling of the flair, isn't it? I think that's what people want from him to push it forward, especially against sides on paper. You're not expecting him to go to Anfield and play like that. Yet they sort of did. <laughs> so it makes you think, well, come on. Come on, can we do this at home to Palace? That's that's why I said I think Monday could be a t could be a really important game from that perception point of view because if Palace, a Palace side who can't get a win under their belts, were to go to Forest and win, not to make you guys nervous, but there is a feeling about that around this game. I think, especially with potential Gibbs White out, there's doubts about Sales in goal as well with his groin situation. So yeah, let's see. There's, you, there's you've already made me nervous about the essay sorry, factors, have you? <laughs> there's a, that sort of yeah. stat scares me to death. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. There's, there's, I know. There's, but... there's an interesting feeling around around Forest fan base that if if Forest were fa to fail to win on Monday, that it really glosses over the start we've had to the season because we're only two better, two points better off than we were last season. But um, obviously, looking at it from from a kind of a step backwards, you like. Well, Forest have been really good on the road, but really poor at home. And it's kind of like, normally it's the roles reverse. So we've always said, like, if you kind of threw them results up in the air, we actually won all three games at home, drew maybe to Southampton away, it would look like a completely different picture. And narratives are always completely yeah. told in a different way. Um, I did want to ask Lee, actually, um, a question about Palace. How, how, how are you feeling about them? Because obviously, on paper, like we've said, it's a game we'll probably look at, at winning. I know Seb's going, it's a game Forest fans will probably go, go, yeah, we should win that. So how do you think, feel about it? I mean, I, I don't actually think Forest are the sort of club just yet where we can get to... Yeah, it's a team that we, we should be competitive against. But I think this whole... In the Premier League, we, we're th three seasons in now. I don't think there's, I still don't see Palace as one of those teams that always should be winning this game. I think we should compete in this game. It's not City, it's not Arsenal, but should win. I, I find that, I, I do find that a little bit arrogant, if I'm being honest, that notion. Um, yeah, it'll be a tough game. Look, look how they finished last season. I do think that was skewed a little bit because a lot of the pressure was off. They weren't really going to finish in Europe and they weren't going to go down. Um, obviously, with the pressure on this season, a couple of injuries. Glasner's found it a little bit trickier. Um, 
But yeah, it'll still be a tough game. I think I've read this morning that Wharton's uh, expected to be back in the squad. Is it Munoz, the wing back? He's he's looking hopeful as well. So they're going to have players back. Um, and I think, to be honest, Sebit the nail on the head earlier when he said that their front line just needs to click. Um, I think the issue they've got, I do uh, a bit of a section in the programme and I interviewed a Palace fan for, for a piece and he was saying that they've signed Nketiah but they've played him in the position that Elise uh, occupied. So it, it's two com- it's chalk and cheese, they're two completely different sort of players. So in that context, it's just not clicked yet. But let's face it, they've still got some really good players. Um, much like Fulham did have, to be fair. So we, we need to go in with the mindset that is completely opposite to how Nuno did against Fulham, if you ask me. I think we need to go into it with a, a bit more of a, a front foot approach uh, and actually give it a go rather than leaving it at 10 o'clock on Monday night thinking, well, we've done it again. That was another missed opportunity. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm in agreement. I mean, I thought um, when Nuno first came in, Seb, I don't know if, if, you, if you kept tabs on this, but like against Bournemouth, Man United, Newcastle, kind of, Front footed and full blooded, so it kind of I think it threw everyone off that Fulham game. I mean, we tried a <laughs> four 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 two without any wingers, and we were trying to play Elliot Anderson and Nico Dominguez out wide, and they've got no pace really, in, like between them to take a man on and kind of run out of defence. And it was a bit strange. I thought like a diamond might have suited that that those the four port personnel more prominently. With Palace, um, weirdly, I know they've been not winning any games, but they've actually had like the second least amount of touches from opposition teams in their own box, which is from the other 14 on Twitter. They're quite a good source of information, to be fair. I did want to ask, like, where do you get like your stats and fact checks and that sort of thing? But what, what else? What what else do you think of 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 how how Forest should really approach the game? How do you kind of see the game being played out from both perspectives? We have a magnificent stats department at Sky. They're absolutely fantastic because there's quite a large team. And before every game, they will they will give a lot of detail about how sides have played from, from a stats point of view. I also work for the Premier League and I work on a show called Premier League Data Zone. And we get stats supplied through that as well. And they're also, those stats are individual player stats where they, they track players' movements and what players do when they're on the ball. It's a system that's used by uh, a, f- a few clubs, actually. One of the clubs that uses it the most in the Premier League is Manchester City, uh, which is a good sign if you were looking to get involved with that sort of stuff. And <clears throat> from that point of view, that's why I said earlier about the similarities between yourselves and Everton. You have a very sort of passive way of defending, as in you don't engage sides when they're coming on to you. You tend to say to them, well, go on then, try and try and break us down. And that's not easy either, actually. Um, I'm not suggesting at all that you you part the bus. That's not what Forrest do. But there is an element of that disengagement, perhaps, when a side's coming on to you. That very much suits the centre-halves that you have um, because they are centre-halves who, despite the criticism from Rilo in the air, both of them fantastic, especially, especially Milenkovic this season. I think aerially he's been absolutely unbelievable um i say unbelievable because you think for the money you paid for him and now he's being linked to other clubs already that's what i mean is that we think well why weren't they involved why weren't newcastle looking at him for the money that sort of thing and this is always the way of things isn't it the way it works in the the chain of the premier league is that from a data point of view they will obviously look at the data of players and see but they want the proof that they can handle it and often they don't mind seeing players going to clubs in Forest's position whereby this is what they say about the shark circling they'll look at that and go okay we'll see how he does at Forest. let's see how he does at Forest." and if they they tick all the boxes then they'll start to test the water with Forest. now this is where Forest as a club have to decide where maranakis decides am i going to be the club that then says here you go newcastle you can now have this player this is your price off you go or will they fight that or will they say no actually we think we can compete with you, especially with if the rules are as they are, then we think to ourselves, well, can we compete with you? Maybe we'll hold on to him for a little bit longer. Maybe we'll make it difficult for him. And if the player is happy, then they'll stay. Um, to go back to your point about stats, though, they do certain stats do play a very important picture in analysing a player, and they are pretty accurate because they are basically what you see. You know, is, is this player doing this? Is this what the numbers say? Weirdly, the ones we measure 
for example, assists. I always think assists is an interesting one. But I don't really get into assists when I'm doing the data zone shows because assists can come in various guises. Somebody can rack up a lot of assists because they're put into an excellent position by the team's general play. And they're just the player that benefits from that. Um, goals, you can't discount goals because ultimately goals will win matches. So we can say a player's getting themselves in good positions and the XG is good and all of that, but you just got to put the ball in the net and that's what everybody remembers. So you're always constantly battling between stats and results. What are the, sta are the stats influencing the results? Um, I would say in the Premier League, more than anything else, it's a very strong indicator, I think, for sides. And what I said about both the both Palace and Forest looking at the data, both look defensively strong. Both don't give the opposition many opportunities to score goals as it stands. But I would say Forest do it in a much more passive way in terms of they won't push up on sides and say quickly harass them and try and win the ball back. Although I'm sure Ryan Yates would love to do that every opportunity. But you have to remain, you have to remain in that structure of thinking, this is how our team is going to play. And I I think that's very important. And actually, Yates is a good example of that. If they buy into the manager's thinking and the way the manager wants to play, they become important players for that manager. And that's why players can quickly fall out of favour and certain other players are favoured by the manager um, because it's all about the team. And we we put so much emphasis on individuals' performances, but it has to be remembered in that team framework. Um, and I look at that from a point of view. I'm always looking at the team. I obviously have to big up individual performances because that's... The, the 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 glamour of it all but i just see how how does a team work and how do these players work for a team we could apply that to england as we can to not nottingham forest as we can to chesham who are aside i'm going to be covering in the fa cup in a few weeks <laughs> that sounds mint <laughs> yeah. i think going from obviously we've just discussed the defense does does um Obviously, we didn't sign a striker in the summer. We kind of placed faith in Warden a one year. A one year is not quite fit. I think it has to be said. Um, he's certainly not getting game time. Obviously, Wood's thirty two now. I mean, again, not not to repeat the question, but it, Wood just keeps defying the odds, doesn't he? I mean, it, is it to a certain degree a shock how well he's done at Forest? And and do you think that a striker is going to have to be the next kind of port of call in the transfer market for the club? I think it's the hardest position to recruit because if you have a striker who's doing well, what striker are you bringing in? You have to find a striker who's a lot better than Chris Wood who's going to hit the ground running. You're linked to Nketiah, for example. Would he have done a better job than Wood? And the money you'd have to spend on it, I, you know, I, I don't think so. So it's that's the problem that you have. I think you're in a good position in, in the profile of the two strikers, but Awani's... Fitness is obviously the biggest issue at the moment. Um, and it, I think it's hard for big strikers as well. I mean, you're carrying a lot of weight around. I think that's what makes it so incredible about Harlan is that what he goes through in a game, what he puts his body through and a man of that size, it takes a lot. It's a big toll. Like We think that big strikers, okay, they're throwing their weight around, but ultimately our brains are all the same size. And you have to go through, the more weight you're carrying around, the more you've got to... You, the stress of it on your body. Um, oh, I, and I wonder with Owen e if that's what's happened in his case particularly. But Wood, you know, I don't think you can knock... <laughs> you can't knock Wood, you know. <laughs> I don't think this is a player who... I, 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 When he went to Forest, I, I even thought from Newcastle's point of view, that's a, that's a good case in point. They have Isak and they've got Callum Wilson. So what do you need Wood for on top of that? He's then maybe a perfect third striker, but he wants to play. He believes he's somebody who should be playing. And that's what's brought him here. And he is playing. He's scoring goals um, this season. He's, he's. I think we have to just think from the Tottenham angle when they had Kane for all those years. And the problem was, who's the reserve? And they, the, finding a perfect reserve was always difficult. I think you just have to cross your fingers and hope that your main man stays fit. And that you can get our knee back to fitness because if you can get him back to fitness, it's there. The risk is now Forrest thinking we can go for a striker who is, who's better than those two players. That's where dreams die. I think it, I really do. I think you 
so many clubs will look at it and think, what can we do? Let's take another example, Arsenal with Kai Havertz. A lot of Arsenal supporters will say, we can do better than him. Well, if you want to do better than Kai Havertz, how much money are you spending? How much pressure are you putting on your football club to get a player who's better than that? This is always the tricky scenario. That's the only warning I'd say for Forest supporters is, in fact, I'll throw it to you guys. Name me a striker who's realistic for Forest who is better than Wood and Awani. That that we can get, God knows. Mm. Like I mean, we was we were obviously we was linked to Enkete, went to Palace, and not not quite hit the ground running. But we've we've kind of reiterated he's playing in an out of position. Jimenez didn't want to come from final. He kind of had reservations. Got, looked like he wanted to go to AC Milan because they were sniffing. Has obviously got injured now, which. Uh, fans gloated in weirdly i didn't know why and then uh mamouche was like a light late late kind of bid to get someone and he's absolutely destroying the bundesliga at the moment and he looks like he's going to go to a far better team than, than forest i have to say so realistically i've answered the question no probably not like it's it, it let you, you we're, we're in the position where we're gonna have to take a punt on a younger striker really and kind of go right we'll we'll let you make your mistakes kind of give you minutes off the bench here and there, give you the odd start and hope they come good either very quickly or or over a period of time where you can give them that development time to, to bed in. I would have loved to got someone like Victor Roque in from who ended up going to Real Batiste, who got him on loan at least for the option to buy. But can't, these things happen, don't they? So, And there's a, there's a fair few other strikes. I can't remember now. There was another Brazilian and ended up going... He ended up, either didn't move or went somewhere else and I can't remember what his name is now for the life of me. But yeah, so... That, that's Adam, you've, touched, you've, touched, you've touched on something there. I think I generally think in this day and age, and I think analysts are, even from a point of view of employment in football, I always think to myself, there's so many players out there. And if you can find that gem, if you can find that person who's going to take you to the next level, I mean, it's worth so much to a football club. And it's actually hard work. It's really hard work because you're competing. Who are you competing against? And it, I don't think it matters what level. It's it's obviously harder the lower down you go, but at the same time you can say, well, actually there's more opportunity to find a difference maker the lower down you go. It's harder the higher up you get, as I've just the case in point I've said, even in the Premier League. And um, then you you know, mentioning players from across Europe, you just don't know. You bring them into the system. How are they going to adapt? How are they going to settle in? What's their family life like? How were they really comfortable in the environment they're in? You take them out of that. What's their entourage like around them? Do they get on with the manager? How will they respond to playing in front of those interesting fans at the city ground? <laughs> so, you know, this is this, this so much goes into it. And True. you've got to hold on to what you, you've got to think to yourself if, if Wood and Awani are fit, are they good enough to help Forest reach their objective for this, this particular season? Yes, I think they are. And um, are they the 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 answer for the next five, ten years? No, of course they aren't. So maybe to answer your question, are you then looking for that next cab off the rank? But where do you get them from? Are you going down the league and saying, yeah. if we give you an opportunity to come up and play in the Premier League, how many minutes are they going to get? Look at um, Jay Stansfield, who's gone to Birmingham, for example, going and paying the money that they paid. You would say he's actually the perfect profile of striker for Fulham to have as a backup striker. But maybe he's gone, no, actually, do you know what? I want to play. I want to play. And that's the other problem. They, they've got to want to be that player who's not playing football. It's really hard situation. So, um, you know, we've spoken about this for a while now, but <laughs> I think you just got to say, w would Palace take Chris Wood? I think they would. And and they take Awani as well. Mateta, I mean, in the last game, Mateta was on the bench. And they tried to get you through the middle and Saar, Saar on the right. I mean, look at Saar, you know, as Milo Saar was a player that a lot of clubs were looking at when he was at Watford. Um, and he went away, he's gone to Marseille, now he's back at Palace again. Again, you think, is that a smart signing from them? Possibly, but we'll see. But he's got to settle in. Yeah, I mean, the, the one the one thing I will say about Chris Wood, uh, Seb, is every game he scored in this season, we've, we've drawn. So Yeah, that's true. If, so hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully he breaks that duck. He hasn't scored in many games where we've won, weirdly. I think it's like three or four, and he's not far from being our uh, all-time Premier League top goal scorer taking over. Is it Brian Roy? Yeah. Isn't it? 
Yeah, he's got 24. I think he's five away from equaling it. Is he? Is he yeah. he's on 20 or 19 at the minute? It's 19, yeah. I think he's on. We are going to get into some uh, formation prediction kind of stuff. So I'm going to put Palace's team up first, which I thought, think could be the team, but Seb, you might be able to correct me because you said something about injuries and stuff. So it's just on screen. So I've gone, it's a 3-4-3. Three, three. I've put Dean Anderson in goal. Mm. I can't say the right centre-half centre, uh, name, and I've seen him on football. Lacroix. Manager, yeah. Lacroix. I Lacroix. thought it was, yeah. but I wasn't sure. <laughs> uh, Mark Gurhey, uh, Nathaniel Chalabar, uh, Tyreek Mitchell, Adam Wharton, Jefferson Lerma, Daniel Munoz, Saar, Mateta and Eze. Would that be the sort of team you'd expect to kind of see Palace line up with on Monday or, or something similar? I know because their centre and midfield partnerships change nearly every week. I've had a look. It's like either Kamada or Wharton's the... The prominent figure, but it's whoever plays mm. next to him it seems to change every time. Similar to how we had Murillo with about eight different centre halves last season next to him. Oh yeah. Well, I think in Adam Morton's case, and uh, still a fitness doubt. I mean, he's he's been carrying a knock. I think it's a groin situation at the moment. And whether they risk him, he pulled out of international duty with England on the twenty ones. Do you maybe just give him a night off? I think Will Hughes has done quite well, and I've seen him this season to play in the midfield. Um, Kamada's an interesting one because Japan, I noted, I think they played him in a wide area um, rather than in the 10. And look, he's a player that the manager knows really well, hence why he's brought him in here. Um, I wonder, I don't know, though, away from home, whether he'd be the player that you'd bring in. I'd fancy more uh, uh, Will Hughes to come in if, if Wharton can't make it. Munoz is a tough one because he's probably been arguably one of, well, probably the Palace's most consistent performer when I've seen him this season. And you'd want to play him. They are short, I think, in terms of maybe the quality now uh, in the fullback areas. So you've got Klein, you have Joel Ward, but that is a step down from Munoz, the way he's been performing this season. So, you, you know, from a Forest point of view, you'd be hoping he's not fit um, and they'd be... I think he's more the one they want to try and push through than Wharton, actually, because you think in one long term with Wharton, look, he's just been nominated for one at the Golden Boy Award. Um, he's a huge talent. Do you just think, right, let's not try and push him through this game now, if it's, especially the groin, which is a really niggly one, um, speaking from my own experience of that area. Um, yeah, it's it's quite... Uh, yeah, I don't know if you'd take that risk. Um, but they're the doubts. They're the two main doubts, I'd say. Uh, that to me looks sensible away from home. Is there on the on that side? Just need him to get more goals at the moment, and uh, that's what they're looking for. I mean, but, but not starting on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So maybe a few more shots, yeah, that don't go in. Um, yeah, so, so you, you maybe there's a slight tinge of disappointment from him. Maybe he wanted that big move this summer. He maybe felt that was the moment to go. But the Palace have got to look after themselves. You know, they can't lose. You can't lose so many big players in one summer. So Elise was the one to go in the front line and then Anderson was the one to go in defence and, you know, that, let that be that. You can't disrupt his team too much. So they are right to hold on to him. Um, but, I, yeah, looking at the side, I think, yeah, the doubts are Wharton and Munoz, aren't they, really? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one because I thought Eze would be the one to move, whereas Elise had, like, a lot of stop-starts to his career, but it's obviously adapted to, to the Bundesliga like a duck to water, but... Yeah, well, we'll uh, I'll just ask Lee. Uh, Lee, have you, what do you make of that team if that was to be the team? Where where do you see Forrest getting joy? Uh, well, I'm hoping Munoz doesn't play because I'm pretty sure he played against us last year and he was absolutely brilliant. Um, I think we drew one all, didn't we? Uh, yeah, was that, that right. Edder over Anderson, didn't he? Him and Callum um, and Adoy were fighting out in the right back position after they, he ran across from from right to left. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, I think you look at that team as, as it is now, and even with the players that aren't included on there that will likely make up the bench if that is the team. I think there's so much quality in that team still. Um, it's a team that months ago everyone was tipping for Europe uh, because of how they finished last season. So there is some quality there. What I would say is when you play in a team that's not won a game yet. We say it every game, particularly on this podcast, when we're doing our predictions, but it's the real game where it would be great to score early because it's going to be a long trip for Palace. It's going to be an overnight stay. They're going to come up on the Sunday. They're going to be up for getting that first three points. As Seb alluded to earlier, it's a winnable game for them, whichever way we, we, we want to dress it up. They will see it as a winnable game. 
the last thing they want to do is put all that preparation in and then concede early at a place like Forest. And again, that's not me being arrogant with the place like Forest, but we, we've seen teams struggle when we have scored first. So it would be good to get that first goal, put the pressure on them to then think, God, if we're going to win tonight, we've got to score twice now. Um, and yeah, I just think it'd settle everyone down because as we've said before on this podcast, the atmosphere, you go back to that very first game in the Premier League at home with the West Ham game, the atmosphere has kind of got gradually worse. Again, whichever way you want to dress it up, that's probably not the right term of phrase that it's got worse, but it is getting quieter. You know, the worse the form gets with each draw, with each defeat at home, the atmosphere does seem to be creeping backwards a little bit. So an early goal against a team that's not won yet, I think would be uh, a recipe for success on Monday night. It's, it's, it's funny because of, of that narrative because I thought against Bournemouth it was largely all right because we was winning mm. and I think if we don't get the kind of damp squib of Toffolo hitting the ball on the back of Murillo's head and it falling to Antoine Semenu to score, then I think it's a different story. And then, and and the, and the Wolves game as well where Bellegarde just lashed one into the top corner. Like It's all it's all ifs, buts and maybes, isn't it, with it all? It's just really funny game football. But um, I'm going to bring your team up, Lee. So... Um, so you've gone four two three one. You've you've kind of banked on um, Brittany de Villiers, the the girlfriend of Morgan Gibbs White, being right in her story that he's he's walking. She deletes it. He's got crutches, but he's actually walking. And she did she deleted. Of course she did. Like it's just all mind games. I think I think she's part of the plan. Um, so four two three one from from Lee, uh, an unchanged back five of Sells, Aina, Milenkovic, Murillo, Alex Moreno. Yates partnering uh, Elliot Anderson in the absence of James Ward Prowse, Gibbs White, Alanga, Hudson Adoy behind Chris Wood. Um, what's your first thoughts on that, Lee, as well? Yeah, I mean, what I would say is if Gibbs White doesn't make it, I wouldn't put Anderson in the 10. I'd actually give uh, Hyota Silver a start. I think he deserves a start. He's just been knocking on the door. I think um, we saw against. I just think you're falling into that trap of potentially going with a similar approach to the Fulham game if you start messing about with um, putting another... Because it'd probably be Dominguez, wouldn't it, that he'd use instead. And then you've got cent centre midfield FC again. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think I'd go more like for like. I think that sort of setup is certainly gives us the best chance of a victory. Um, I think it lets us play on the front foot. I think it's a, a system that is tried and tested this season. I think when we've played well this season, we've largely had that system in play. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, that would be... Uh, I'm hoping it's something very similar, if not Gibbs... What, I mean, there's a doubt with Cels as well, in there, I suppose, but I, from what I understand, I think he's... I think he will make it. So, yeah, it's just yeah. a Gibbs-White situation, but I would definitely be giving Silver a start um, if he doesn't uh, pass the yeah. fitness test. Definitely. Um, so, what, what's your thoughts on this and and how, how well, I don't know what what sort of sources you get in terms of players being injured or available or do you find out on the day of, of it all I think that the thing is it's all always about what you don't know is they want to give players a chance so it's quite late to test these things like I said with Wharton and Munoz they're not completely ruled out and that's the same with Gibbs White you know not completely ruled out but I think the idea is it's not. It's not looking. It's not looking good. I would say. So if 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 Gibbs White's involved in Monday, you know they pushed him to be involved. You know they wanted to be involved, which is good reason. I think it's the same with Sells. I think Sells has been good this season. Um, after the chaos of goalkeeping last season, um, <laughs> he steady, he steadied the ship a bit as the you know as he came in, and he's taken it on another level this season. It feels like. Um, so you want you know you want that goal. I don't know. Carlos Miguel, all he has to do is just lie across the goal and he'll block most things when he's absolutely massive. Um, it was quite funny. It was, it was the League Cup, wasn't it? That, yeah. You know, the the the, 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 the uh, Newcastle goal, which probably didn't fill people with too much confidence considering the situation. But, you know, you've got to take into account somebody coming into the league and, you know, first game and everything else. But it did make me think about Jota Silva, obviously, um, as an option. I think he's probably the option in terms of, Again, going back to what I think the fans want, they want that little bit of spark, don't they? I think Elliot Anderson is a very talented player. I don't think he excites people necessarily, but he's a very, I think he's a very strong player with a lot of potential. Um, he's playing the match for the under 21s during the international break. Interestingly enough, Newcastle had a problem in that Eddie Howe 
gave him a, a lot of minutes, but he was often used as the player. And Eddie Howe does this, actually. He's got a few players that are almost his dog's bodies. His players that, Sean Longstaff's an example, Murphy's another example. Players where he knows, they're the players who will listen to every single word I've said and they'll do a, a, a job for me. I had a, I did a game with them last back in the last season where they he was having to play left wing back Anderson and he was defending <laughs> on the, on the left-hand side um, really deep. And they almost were playing a back five at some points and he was the left wing back. So he's somebody who, wherever you put him, he'll try and do a job. And the question is, where is his best position? And I'm still not entirely sure because playing the 10 is a lot of responsibility, which I actually think Gibbs White deals with very well, because if you're going to have that position, which is often considered a free position, then you've got to bring a lot to the attack. You've mm. got to be scoring goals, creating goals, and making something happen. Whereas at least with Jota Silva, you feel like he knows that's his role. That's If he's going to come into the team, he's going to be an attacking player. He's looking to make something happen. So it's clearer then. If you put Anderson there, we don't know if he's going to be that player who's going to make something happen. And I know it's strange to say because we don't have a big enough sample size for Jota Silva in the Premier League. Um, but I get, I'm get, i guessing that's why you guys want him to start ahead of Anderson in that role. I think you want Anderson in the team, don't you? But yeah. not in that role for that reason. Um, and what's happened to Dominguez? Why is he not one of your first thoughts in the team? Yeah. What's, what's going on? I mean, I, I, don't, I can't speak for Lever. I just have I've no idea. Just just touching on Anderson before Lee comes in. Yeah. It, it's funny. Anderson won Player of the Month for from for Forest, playing central midfield for the first two or three games and was excellent. And then we sh we've shafted him out wide. I mean, he was excellent against Liverpool in terms of a of a job to do in in terms of the game plan. So I can't fault Nuno's tactics or Anderson's endeavour there. But I do think centrally. I, I said at the start of the season when we signed him, I was like, I was like he's he's the centre midfielder that we need. I didn't think he was a 10, to be fair. I thought his ability to pick the ball up from deep and either drive forward or pick a pass because he's very tidy and technical in what he does, I thought he, he would excel as a central midfielder and someone that we thought Lewis O'Brien would do in terms of being able to pick the mm. ball up and, and kind of carry it through midfield. But um, Lee, what, what, what were you going to say? Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I think... Um... I just think you'd probably you'd, you'd lose something by putting Anderson in the ten. I think you want him in that more centrally, that num sort of that number eight area. I think his work rate and his how comfortable he is on the ball. I mean, he's clearly not a, a similar sort of player. But you look at Wharton when he gets the ball. Obviously, he's got that elegance of being left footed, hasn't he? So I think Anderson can kind of bring something similar to that. I think his work rate's good. He, he gets forward and helps out up there anyway. So I think by sticking him as a ten. There's no guarantee that he's going to do the Gibbs White role where he actually does drop back. He might get kind of suckered into staying higher. So, yeah, I just I just think his work rate alongside Yates could make them to a, a decent pairing. That's all. Definitely. I mean, I'm going to bring my team up. So I, I've banked on Brittany De Villiers' information as well. Obviously, that <laughs> more Gibbs White starting, but I've put Jota Silver out wide. So my team is is the only difference is is Jota Silver playing right wing because I thought, and I'm oh, sorry, I think Anthony Langer has been really ineffective when starting games but really impactful when he's had to come on and kind of prove a point and I'd like to see it from the start but the more you've spoke about it and more the more I think that if, if Gibbs White's unavailable I think Jota being in there is is a great idea I think I don't know how much you've seen of him said but he's we've nicknamed him the Portugrealish because he kind of emulates <laughs> him he's just got absolutely massive yeah. eyebrows I mean they're scary <laughs> as well um but I, yeah, when, I, he I when he scored he, against Newcastle, he did look a bit scary after say celebration. I, I think <laughs> he's he's a player that will he will unnerve defenders, irritate opposition fans because of kind of like how he looks in terms of like his hair and, and everything and his low cut socks and everything. But I think he's a player that you'd absolutely love to have in your team because of his aggression and his high intensity. And I think he's He's kind of took a bit took us by surprise because there was talks in the summer that he was going to get loaned out and shut and farmed off to Olympiacos at one point. And we was going, why the heck would we sign a player from the Portuguese league for 12 million quid when he was I mean he only scored two less goals than Evan Nilsson for for Bournemouth, who's cost them god knows how much money. Mm -hmm. He he's clearly a player that 
has got a lot about him. And I looked at his career and he, he's moved he's moved team nearly every season of, of, till, till he got to Victor Gimaraes and played like two seasons there. So he's clearly got that drive in him. And, and I think he's someone that could become a he's quickly become a fan favorite so i'm i'm really interested to see him play you know as a commentator you must be can't you must be rubbing your hands almost yeah i mean he's come i think he's come on as a sub in every game bar one i think yeah. off the top yeah, of my yeah. head and uh, so from that point of view he's obviously trusted by the manager the manager wants to get him involved in the team and that does bode for him starting making his first premier league start on monday if if Gibbs White's not available, it's just whether Nuno looks at that. I think the Fulham game's the reference point for him, isn't it? He's going to look at that and he's going to think, how did that work? Did it work? What bits worked for us in possession, out of possession? Because we also have to take into account the opposition and how much damage they're going to do, what sort of player you want operating that area. You've got Jota Silva on the right there, which is going to be Palace's area where you know, Tyrick Mitchell is, he's a good one-on-one -on -one defender, Tyrick Mitchell, but Very good, you know, yeah. maybe if you look, if you think, if you're going to have a player who's going to make maybe some clever runs off him or somebody's going to do something off the ball that's going to destabilise him, um, then that could be the way he's thinking as well. Because he's there's so much at play for managers when they're trying to select their side, because you want consistency, but you also want to maybe surprise the opposition, but you also want to try and cater for the opposition. Um what I think what we are certain of is that the back four will be unchanged and and the, the centre back pairing will be unchanged, which is something in itself, I have to say. I think every forest game I did last season, it felt like it was Murillo and somebody else. Um uh, I don't I don't, I can't really remember doing a forest game where it felt like it was the same partner with him every time. So that in is just such a great starting point. And I, I actually think it's like if cells can play in and cells and the two center halves, that unit, that three can just stay together for most of the season, then Forrest will be absolutely fine. Um, I think they'll be fine anyway. I said this last season and there was a lot of worry about them going down. But I, ju I just think they're better than the sides that have come up. Um, and so there's your starting point. And then from there, it's thinking, right, where are we operating in? Who are we operating against here? Now, Wolves have had a poor start to the season. Obviously, Palace have. You expect Palace to push on from here, maybe starting Monday. Who knows? Don't know. Um, <laughs> but Palace is stuck. But from, from this point of view, you're now thinking, where are we? Are we better than Brentford? I always think Brentford are a good marker. So I'd ask you guys, where do you see yourselves in relation to Brentford? I think we're better... <sighs> I think our squad's better than Brentford's on paper. I, this is going to come back to bite me. But I think Bre <laughs> Brentford, what Brentford have done really well over, a, certainly since Thomas Frank's been there, it is a good core of probably seven or eight players that they managed to get on that pitch every single week. And I think we're still striving for that a little bit. But I do think our, if you lined up our group of players and their group of players and said to Wolves, you can pick three from both of those sheets of paper, I think there's a good chance they'd probably pick two from us and one from them. Well, who would you take from the Brentford side if you could Brian take Brian Hundred percent and Boymo. Yeah, yeah um, I can't believe he didn't get linked away in the summer. Yeah, a bit surprised they kept him. To be fair, especially with like Newcastle wanting Alanga, and they, mm. I, I thought like a perfect player to to fill the Alma on boots would have been in Boymo from from a Newcastle point of view. I mean, if I were I don't know who that. I know it was Dan Ashworth before he went to Man United, mm. but whoever their like head of recruitment, he'd have been top. Well, that of the was list. the problem, yeah. Paul Mitchell, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think he could play for anyone. I think he could play for anyone in the league. Actually, I think he yeah, could. Okay. He could be even if he's not starting a bench player. Mm. Very effective. You think of any team. I mean, obviously, there's you know you go through the teams and they've got strong right wing elements. Obviously, Liverpool do, Arsenal do. But if you're then saying right, who are you bringing off the bench? You know. I, I I wonder if he would play that role at those clubs if he would ha be happy to do that. You get you do get the minutes, you know. It's a chance to relieve Salah or relieve uh, Saka. You know that's that's. Uh, I think those minutes would come. But um, yeah, it's, but it's interesting that he you just went for him and you didn't start rattling off a group of players, which is, which then I think suggests these things because that's where you feel you are should be in the league. That's how I like to gauge it. You go through the teams. And you start working, about, you know, who would I take from this team and put in ours? And if you're thinking one, two players, then you think, oh, oh no, we should be above them. So if I ask you the question about Man City, how many of those players you would take, it'd probably be double figures, wouldn't it? So it's a tricky one.
I'll tell you one or two. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Har- oh, yeah, by the, by yeah. the way, Har- Harland is the player. Harland and Semenya are the players with more shots than Eze. So if that helps I, you, you I face Semenya already. I did want to make a, a bit of a thing about Chris Wood earlier as well. And I forgot to do it until now, but his conversion rate is sensational. Um, and as a, a to say he's a big guy, and everyone when we, when we first got him, everyone was like, "Oh, he's a target man." He, he really isn't. He's very much more of a poacher. It's told by his goal from last week against Chelsea, where he's 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 got onto that knockdown from Milenkovic and just poked it home. I mean, he doesn't get very many chances, um, but he's on. He's on for at least like maybe second or third in the Golden Boot this season, as as things stand. So, we'll I'll, take I'll, I'll say I'll say another point about Milenkovic. I covered uh, in the World Cup in Qatar, uh, game between Cameroon and Serbia, which was one of my favourite games I've commentated on. Three three ended up. Wow! And I remember the first half of that game. Uh, Milinkovic was in a defence. I think Pavlovic was another. They they all seem like the same type, you know, archetypal, big, like massive, really good in the air. Um, I'm good in the water in Serbia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, something in the water at centre half. That's for sure. But I did, I did. It's that classic thing. If you take players like that out of their comfort zone, they can be shown up. But if you keep them in their comfort zone, they are worth it. And I think that explains the way Forest are playing at the moment. They're very comfortable, especially when you've got players good on the ball next to him as well. I think it just suits them. They're going to play like this. They're going to defend like this all season, which is a strength, I think, from a unit point of view. But maybe some teams will think of different ways of working it out. But um, yeah, to go back, I keep going back to it. I just, I just, the first thing I thought of this Forest team is that if that if that unit is there most of the season, they'll be absolutely fine. And then it's on to those forward players. Can Wood keep converting those chances? Or Hudson Odoi keep curling the ball into the top corner from the left hand side? We'll see. We'll see. If that happens, then, you know, who knows? Who knows? You know, I'm not suggesting Conference League, but because I think there are a lot of good teams. There's so many good teams. There's so I mean, many good teams. I think that's the problem. I think it's just we are, a bit we are, out of reach. I do think we're a few clicks away from. from the forward line being really effective. And I mean, I don't know if, if Lee will agree with that, but we're definitely for the first few games, we was creating a lot of chances and just not converting. But I'm, I'm, I'll give it, to, we've got to give it time and I'm sure we'll get it right at some point. Yeah, but, I agree with that. I think, I think um, the key for me is, is sticking with the players that he fancies to play in that front four and, and just giving it three or four games, if not longer, just to get it to click and to try and, I don't think it's doing us any good having one system, although it's working away. I don't think it's doing us too much good having certain systems for home and away. It's, it almost feels like we're focused on what the other team can do to hurt us rather than what we can do to hurt them. I think these next four games, Lee, are, will give us opportunity to do that because we've got, mm. what is it? So pa- pa- Palace, Leicester, New- uh, West Ham, Newcastle or whatever it is. I don't know what if that's the right order, but yeah, three at home, it, it gives us good good opportunity especially against that cluster of teams but um Seb before you well I was I was I, what I would say is I was asked to do Leicester Forest but it clashed uh with something else so um uh, I'll be missing that uh East Midlands derby that's for sure um it's not a, derby a bit of a to shame it's not a derby to yeah us, I know I know I know nobody nobody dis- just <laughs> nobody dislikes Leicester today um I have, I have no. to get that in there to, to irk any Leicester supporters even if they're not <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, they need a rival. They need to look for yeah, a rival Coventry somewhere. Coventry City, down the line. Yeah, down the, down Coventry the road, City, well. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I'm looking at your fixtures now. Yeah, you've got, yeah, you've got West Ham as your next home game after this one and then Newcastle at home. Yeah. And then a trip to Arsenal. So, um, oh, it's actually you? weird. You've got Arsenal, between Arsenal away and City away, you've got Ipswich at home. Yeah. Which should suggest to me, yeah, there's going to be a bit of, a fact, I mean, well, that's quite December right. is minging. Got... December yeah. is absolutely minging. Arsenal minging. away, we'll be, we'll be, City away, we'll be, we'll Man United play, away. When we come to play Ipswich, that'll be the game to put us in like Champions League spots anyway. So <laughs> that's true. Yeah, you'd moment. be one, off the, <laughs> one point off the top title race. Um, yeah. um, just before you go, uh, Seb, I don't know if you're allowed to give a prediction of, of sorts for the game, but could can you? A uh, nil-nil. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. I don't know. I don't know. I'll push it back. One one. I'll go for one one then. Generally, we do draw with Palace anyway. If we've yeah, been one it's... since we've come back up, and it was a it was a VAR check in our favour. Luckily, um, I, I mean, from that, that point of view, I, I'd love a three three. That would, I love a three three. They always seem to be good games, don't they? Three three. But I don't know who. I don't, I just do. I see that 
I, do you never know sometimes when you've got two sides who have looked quite good defensively play each other, there is a sense of actually, well, maybe we could take a few more risks and nick this, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. It's, it's Like I said, it's a key key game this early in the season because of how both sides have started. Um, well, we'll see. So I've got one final question that you'll probably be able to answer very quickly. Who is the GOAT football commentator? Oh, that's a very good... Well, I don't like saying that sort of stuff. But I say the biggest influence on me when I was a kid was Brian Moore. Um, that was the one for me. Yeah, and I loved his voice and I loved the way he he covered games with a, a certain authority. So, yeah, he's he's the man for me, for sure. Um, but I, I always say with commentary, it's all very, it's a very nostalgic thing, for sure. Who you grew up with, there'll be kids nowadays who grow up with the commentators now who hold them dear to their hearts as they get older. I think that's what people do, and they, they attach commentators to moments. And then you can't change that forever. And that's what I love about the job is that, you, you know, you connected to matches that you cover and football is such an emotional thing. It's such a subjective thing a lot of the time. Um, that's what I love about it. We just don't know. On Monday, we're making predictions about Monday, but who knows? it could be one of the all-time great Premier League games for all we know. We have absolutely no idea. It could be 8-7. Very unlikely, because <laughs> you don't see that score like much in football. But Maybe if it is 8-7, yeah, exactly. If it is 8-7, you know, we'll look back. And there'll be people complaining and saying, oh, bloody, how do we score seven goals? Uh, we concede seven goals in a game like that. That's just football, isn't it? Yeah, that, well, that's why we like it so much, I guess, the unpredictability. Um, so thank you very much for, for being able to join us and give, give us your time. Uh, really appreciate it. I mean, it was literally like, you never, if you don't ask, you don't get, and you, you kindly responded. No. It's been, been a great insight for us. I had to. The moment I saw that cartoon, I thought, you know, I can't I can't say no to Adam after that. That's absolutely outrageous. <laughs> that's uh, that's <laughs> thanks to to, uh, to a guy called Jimmy who, who's done done that for us. I mean, he, we've not asked um, BBC uh, correspondents Steve Hodge and uh, Colin Frey. I mean, we had Colin on last season, so I'm going to try and get him on again and try and see if see if he, what he thinks. But I know he's not. He's not on social media too much, so it'll be an interesting yeah, one to ask him. Absolutely, absolutely. See, what, yeah, it'd be interesting to find out what his prediction would be for Monday. I imagine it'd be more Forest, <laughs> heavy Forest favorite. Three nil, three nil, maybe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, what, I, what I will end with though is that I always say, if I get given a Forest game at home, I absolutely love it because the city ground is right up there for me i just love everything about it even the time spent out of the premier league i was thinking oh, i can't wait for forest to get back in because from my from my point of view it's funny when you're doing the stats and they'll say oh this is Forest's best start since 1995 or whatever and i'll sort of say well there's a reason for that you know this <laughs> time away but that straight away brings nostalgia slap bang for me um because the forest team the frank clark forest team is one of those I'd say early forest memories from somebody of my age. You know, I just think it's just uh, it's just something right. It just felt right. They felt like a side who should be in the Premier League season after season. And also, just from a geography point of view, I just think <laughs> just to spread it out, get fewer teams in London and fewer teams from the northwest, and I think just to balance just balance the country out a bit better. Uh, many, Come on, Exeter. Too many teams in <laughs> London. Yeah, too many, too many teams, teams in London. Exeter. Yeah, Far Plymouth, Plymouth, and uh, yeah, yeah come on, Plymouth, Carlisle. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much, Sam. We really appreciate yeah, thanks, it. Um, hopefully, again, thanks, you on guys. again. Thank you very much. Nice no one. problem at all. No problem at all. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Uh, Lee, I just wanted to ask you. I mean, Reese is going to be really disappointed, especially when he listens to this and when I probably tell him in the WhatsApp group. But we've not had time to do his game. Um, but I did want to get your thoughts and feelings and, and a prediction, obviously, from yourself for for the game on Monday. Yeah, um, as I said, it's uh, it is a chance to win. Um, it's certainly a game we'll look to be competitive in and play on the front foot. Uh, I've got a sneaky feeling for another draw. I've got to be honest. Um, I think it might be more goals. I think maybe two two. I just think this just is two, the two game every week. <laughs> Can we go three three then? Let's go three yeah. three. I, I genuinely think it could be high scoring. Um, that's my head speaking. I think my heart says we might nick it. Um, but it's all going to depend how we start. If we start kind of 
passive akin to the Fulham game, I think then it would probably be a draw again. I, I've just not got a great deal of confidence in us on home soil at the moment while we're still striving for the right sort of makeup. Um, again, it, it, like Seb's just said, with football, I think it, things can change. I might see the team on at seven o'clock on Monday night and think, well, quarter seven nowadays, isn't it? Uh, on Monday night and think, oh, I think we'll win today. But at the moment, I'm, I'm veering towards a draw. My head says a draw. I'll go for. I'm going to two because it's going to come right at one point. I mean, you got um, it right for Brighton. I think it was. Yeah, um, but I, I, yeah, my heart says I hope we nick it. Maybe, maybe two one, perhaps. I mean, I think it all rides on when when we see that team sheet, doesn't it? Of what what yeah, it really what, does. What your true what your true opinion is going to be, and I hope Nuno's kind of learnt that four four two with four central midfielders trying to play two of them out wide is just not the way to go and we've kind of learned from that lesson and we yeah we give we give like the likes of Jota Silva a go really if if, if it comes to it or even if it gives why it's available I'd like to see Jota Silva start anyway just because I've like not seen enough from Anthony Alanga personally but yeah I'm, I'm going to be more positive and I think our defence is going to largely give us that chance to win the game and I think we'll win 2-0 personally I think Wood will finally score in a game where we win as well for a change and some some unlikely hero will get the second or something so yeah that's what i'm going to go for but um no really enjoyable pod um thank you very much to seb hutchinson for joining us and that giving us that time um well i, I mean it's ran for a lot longer than i thought it would be um i have to say uh, yeah but All good, very good yeah if you've enjoyed it obviously drop us a like and uh subscribe it's free and listen obviously on all platforms if, if you're not watching on youtube obviously hopefully you've got to this part anyway um and we'll see you in for the review on tuesday madly uh, so enjoy enjoy waiting even longer um for for a forest premier league game at home but at least like the turnaround then is really really short for this for the next one isn't it lee with leicester so true yeah, big, yeah. Big, so if big, it is a bad result i suppose it's what we always say isn't it when we get a bad result you have to wait too long in the prem well on Monday, if we get one, we won't have to, will we? No, but hopefully it's all it's all guns blazing. Uh, and Leicester plays Leicester plays Southampton away on at the weekend, so that's one to keep an eye on ahead of our game, I think. Because uh, yeah. from what I understand, I think Cooper's up bang under pressure if they don't win there. I mean, they won they won that they won the other week, so I'm sure he's bought a few a bit more time. But anyway, yeah, no, hopefully it's all it's all positive come Tuesday, um, and and we've got a win to talk about. But until next time, we'll see you on the next one. Uh, come on, you Reds.